starting the recording and I'm making you guys host. Okay. Run late. So it's my pleasure to introduce Nivedita Viswanathan from the University of Edinburgh, who will speak on case stability of some singular pets surfaces. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity uh, to talk today. It's my pleasure to talk in this workshop. So it's amazing. So thank you. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about case stability um, of some singular delta zoos, and uh, it's a joint work with Kim and Won. So uh, let's get started. Okay. Um, yeah. So firstly, um, I'll give an overview uh, of what I'm going to talk about for the next one hour. Um, I'll first introduce the objects of study. Uh, what are we going to study? And uh, uh, what sort of restrictions am I going to impose um, on these objects? So that's the first thing. And then uh, why do we care? So what is the motivation behind studying these objects? What was the motivation? Why did it start initially? And um, that was mainly the classification problem. So how do we classify these objects uh, based on what has the classification been done, et cetera? So that leads on to the next section, which is basically um, understanding uh, the case stability of these objects. Again, what do we know? Um, I'm just going to talk about indices one and two because that's how far we know at the moment. There are a lot of open cases beyond that, which I will talk about later. Uh, but yeah, so the third section is just basically me stating the results that we already know about uh, the case stability of objects. Um, and then in the fourth section, I will uh, introduce what beta invariance is. So uh, Chen Yang during his talk yesterday already uh, defined what beta invariant was. So I'm just gonna recall, a quick recall of what the definition is and then few results uh, about the case stability um, using beta invariance. And then uh, is the main section. So that's like, uh, it's the section where we will go through an example very explicitly uh, where there are two different families, one family, um, okay, so it's the same family in a sense that you have one restriction that's different on both, uh, where one uh, of it is going to be um, unstable and the other uh, is going to be k-poly stable. We'll go through the uh, computations very explicitly so you understand uh, how you go about computing uh, beta invariance. And then in the very end, I will conclude by talking about what we can do next. What, what are the sorts of questions we can look at um, given all this data right now, okay? Okay, so let's get started. Oh. Okay, so uh, first, objects of study. What are our objects? Uh, today, we're gonna study um, about hypersurfaces uh, in weighted projective three space. Um, and um, these are nice. I will define what I mean by nice in a minute. But uh, basically, these hypersurfaces are going to be given by um, uh, the vanishing of a polynomial, which is quasi-homogeneous, um, which means that it is homogeneous with respect to the weights on the variables. And the weights here are A0, A1, A2, A3, and I'm taking the variables to be X, Y, Z, and P. Um, okay, so what do I mean by nice? Okay, this doesn't work. One second. Okay, so what do we mean by nice? Um, there are a few restrictions I'm going to impose um, on these hypersurfaces. I want these hypersurfaces to be well formed. What do I mean by that? Um, I need my projective space itself, my weighted projective space itself to be well formed. So, um, which basically means that if within the weights, um, I take the GCD of any three of them, they've got to be co prime. So the GCD should be one between any three of them that I take between the four, and that should hold for any three that I take. So um, that's P being well formed. And um, I want the co-dimension to a strata of P to not be in ST. So P here is three-dimensional. So co-dimension two, meaning that the singular uh, singularities of P in dimension one shouldn't be uh, in my hypersurface SD. So both together is when I say, when, when both together hold is when I say SD is well formed. Um, I also want it to be quasi smooth. Um, and that means that I want the equation which defines my hypersurface to have singularities only at the origin uh, in C4. So the only singularity that this will have uh, is at 0, 0, 0, 0, basically. Okay, so that's what I mean by quasi smooth. And uh, I want the index 
which is defined as the sum of the weights minus the degree of my hypersurface uh, to be positive. So immediately that implies um, that it, this will be a del peso with quotient because my index being positive means my uh, anti-canonical is ample and it's a dimension two uh, and I want it to be quasi smooth. So the only singularities which should be left behind are my quotient singularities. So um, the objects now we have uh, are just del peso surfaces with quotient singularities. Okay. Okay, so these are my objects. Um, and now why do we want to study these objects? So uh, a main problem uh, that we can look at is the classification problem. So let me just state the question first. So given the condition that my degree of the hypersurface it should be lesser than the sum of the weights, given this condition, can I now find the list of all possible um, quintuples which satisfy um, the following part that I need a nice hypersurface with that quintuple to exist. So it's, it's, it's a tough problem. Why? Because I'm not taking a fixed, um, a fixed number. So I'm saying the only thing that's given to me is the fact that the condition D less than the sum of the weights holds. Now I want to figure out the set of all possible such numbers such that such nice hypersurfaces exist. Because that a, a singular surface exists is not going to be that hard, but that it should be nice in the sense that it should be well formed and quasi smooth. That's what makes this um, a lot harder uh, for the existence. So um, I'll give you an example. For example, if I, if I just take at random um, five different numbers, okay, so I've taken one, two, five, and six, and um, uh, I think they add up to 14. So uh, I want just any degree which is lesser than 14. So I'm just, okay, choose 10. Um, now I want to know if given this, can I now sh uh, be sure that there exists a quasi smooth, well formed hypersurface of degree 10 um, in P1256? So, what do we do to show that? We first have to come up with the equation of S. And as I said, S is quasi homogeneous, it's given by a quasi homogeneous polynomial. So, I'm going to have monomials, it's going to be generated by monomials, uh, which are each of degree 10 uh, with respect to the weights on the variables. So when I write down all the monomials in X, Y, Z, and T, which are of degree 10, this is what I end up getting. The coefficients could be anything. I'm just taking the convention that the coefficients are one, but it could just be anything. It could be uh, like, I don't know, 10 or 11 different coefficients there uh, in front of each monomial. Um, now, given this equation, I need to check if it's well-formed and quasi-smooth. That's the next step, right? So, um, okay, so now let, Looking at this equation, it's immediately obvious that you don't have a term which is just dependent on t. You don't have a monomial that's t power n, where n has to be basically 10 because it has to be, uh, it has to be in, in a way, it has to give you a degree 10 with the weights. But you see that there isn't. So automatically, your, uh, your point 0, 0, 0, 0001 is going to lie on this um, surface. And um, okay, that's not bad, but it's also singular at that point because if I don't want it to be singular at that point, every time I substitute any num any any uh, point in that uh, equation, it should give me a linear term. And you will notice that when I substitute 0, 0, 0, 1, there is no linear term there. Um, so this is actually gonna be singular at 0, 0, 0, 1. And I don't want that because I want it to be quasi smooth. And this, is, this isn't. So this is a singular del peso, but it is not a nice hypersurface that we are looking for. So in this case, it doesn't exist. So um, this is exactly what I mean, that if you, give, if you just pick a random five numbers uh, and you want to understand if it exists, you need to do this. You need to be uh, like given a number doing this is not very hard because it's just a matter of checking few conditions, but uh, to be able to give all possible numbers for which such surfaces exist is what is hard. So you can look at this question um, in, in multitude of ways. One way was to look at just the index, so characterize it in terms of the index. Uh, if you remember, the way I defined index was the sum of the weights minus the degree. And I said the index for us has to be positive, right? So this, this uh, uh, this condition that D is less than the sum of weights is exactly telling you that. So if I'm going to take index uh, as my as a way I'm going to characterize these hypersurfaces, then there is a classification uh, that's being done. So what do we know? 
Um, this was exactly the motivation for Johnson and Kola. So they gave us a list of all possible quintuples for which such hypersurfaces exist when the index is one. Um, so the first part, the first um, thing gives you infinite series. Uh, and then you have some sporadic cases. But of course, even in the first, you could have M to be zero uh, because uh, this will just give you one of the sporadic cases here. Um, I just didn't want it to repeat again. So I've just taken M to be one of the natural numbers. Um, but yeah, so this gives you the complete list when index is one for all possible quintuples where it exists, right? So that already gives us um, a very nice way of classifying it. And um, what do we know for index two? Uh, Vanya and uh, Kostya Shramov, they gave us a list in 2013 for uh, index two. And uh, again, something similar, um, you have infinite lists, you have an infinite series, you have a lot of infinite series and you have sporadic cases. Um, but one thing I think you, is, it's very interesting to note is that these, uh, the way they have even uh, classified it it's a lot to do just with combinatorics because you can, uh, you can in a way just completely rewrite the condition for quasi-smooth and well formedness in terms of just um, combinatorial conditions. That is, you you need certain monomials to exist of particular degree if it has to be quasi-smooth and so on. So it's completely like, for example, uh, in Kolas and Johnson's classification, the complete classification is just done based on Kramer's rule. So it's something just with determinants and matrices and it's 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 just it's like linear algebra basically. So it's it's kind of um, it's not even just algebraic geometry. It's just a lot to do with numbers. Um, so that's very interesting. So we have this for index one and we have this for index two, but that's not it. We actually have something more. Uh, for index greater than one, we actually have an algorithm that was written by Eric Pamaru, um, who who actually wrote this. Um, in 2016, and it's it's there in his paper. It's an algorithm uh, that he wrote in uh, in a programming language called Haskell. So uh, it's an algorithm that's there in his paper. So anybody can just uh, play with it to figure out what um, the list of uh, hypersurfaces are. And um, he actually lists a couple of them for a smaller indices. So if I if I if I'm not mistaken, he actually lists it for all i until 10. You are, you have the whole list in his paper. But if, or anything above that, you actually have the algorithm for you to work it out yourself. So um, the question that I asked in the very beginning as to whether we can figure out if all such possible hypersurfaces exist is kind of uh, answered using all of these because they have based the classification on this index. Okay, so um, once we know these things, um, what was the motivation to even classify these objects? Why do we need this? So uh, if, I, if I believe right, um, Johnson and Kolar, the, the reason that they even studied this was to understand the case stability of these objects. So um, they did come up with um, proving the case stability for few. Uh, it's, uh, and then there were a few cases that they didn't manage to do, which the rest, uh, Carolina, uh, Vanya, Park, and Shramov, they, they, uh, they managed to finish this problem. So I'm just going to uh, clearly tell you what they did. So for Kolar, uh, uh, Johnson and Kolar, they actually proved the case stability of most of them, excluding these four. So just this and these four, uh, these three. So it's just, these are the four that they left uh, out of their list. And because, um, yeah, the rest of it, they proved that they were case stable. Um, and they proved it using alpha invariance. Uh, showing that alpha of the value uh, of, of SD was greater than two over three, uh, which proved case stability. Um, and, and then uh, Carolina, she proved um, the case stability for these two. So this one and this one where uh, in, in excluding just uh, cases where the equation of the hypersurface did not contain the monomial YZP. If it did contain the monomial, she had proven that it was case stable. Um, and then Vanya, um, Kostya, Shamov, and Park, they proved the case stability for this and this um, in 2010. And then the one case where it was left behind, where the equation did not contain YZP, was proven by them uh, in 2018. So basically, the whole, uh, the whole list is done for i is equal to 1. So it was proven that all of it um, was case stable. 
okay. Um, so that already answers uh, the case stability, which is index equals one. So let's look at index equals two. What do we know? Um, so Boya, Galiki, Nakamaya, they proved, uh, they proved this uh, for infinitely many um, so hypersurfaces SD with index greater than or equal to two, followed by uh, Vanya, Park, and Shramov, who gave us the list for, for i is equal to two and some of the key poly stability. Um, but it didn't stop there. So, so in, in one of their papers, they actually proved um, the k-poly stability of, um, of a hypersurface of index two. Uh, and the way it looked, it looked very promising that uh, for any hypersurface of index uh, two, it would be all k-poly stable. That was the reason they, they conjectured that for any uh, hypersurface with index two or three, it looked like all of them were just k-poly stable. So that was a conjecture that they had uh, given in um, 2018. But then this was uh, proven wrong by Kim and Won very recently. Um, so they took index two, and uh, now you have the list, you have the five um, families, so two sporadic cases and three infinite uh, cases where they proved that it was k unstable. And the way they did it was to figure out uh, that prime divisor in, that, um, in the hypersurface, which ended up giving them um, the beta value to be negative. So they used, they used, uh, they used very similar methods to what Vanya, uh, Park, and Shamov had done in their paper. So it was very similar, um, but they ended up disproving the conjecture. So now we know the conjecture is false. Um, it doesn't stop there. So this is now our main, uh, our main theorem for today, uh, which is now work in progress because we just have few more families to finish. Uh, it should be done by the end of this year. So it should be, um, it should be out there in archive by the end of this year. But um, yeah, so the, the, the um, statement now is that if my index is just two, everything else other than the five cases that they had, um, proven to be unstable is now k-poly stable. And in particular, uh, what we have now shown is that if SD is going to be this family, then it's k-poly stable. Um, and if it's going to be any one of these, uh, then it's k-stable. This is the one family which we are still, uh, I think there's three, three cases when n is zero, one, and two, it's, it's proving to be a little more uh, difficult than we thought it will be. So otherwise we're all done. Um, so this is now the result, which means um, hopefully by, by, by the end of this year, if this is done, then we are done with index two as well. Um, and so anything higher is what is now left open. Uh, before I proceed, because now I'm going to introduce what case stability using beta invariance is. So I'm gonna define everything. I just wanna know, do you have any questions? Might be a good time to ask. Is there anything now about the singular cases? I mean, the, the non-nice cases, let's put it like this. So in, in, in one of those families, if you take something a little bit more singular, that is not nice, but it's in the same family. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually don't know. Yeah. That's the um, honest answer. Never mind. I don't know. Um, but that's something that, that's interesting, of course. Um, yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to proceed. Um, so I'm just going to recall what um, what beta invariance is. This was something that Chen Yang uh, defined yesterday. So uh, you're going to take x to be any Fano variety of dimension n, and we take f to be um, uh, any projective birational morphism, and uh, we take e uh, to be any prime divisor on y. So then we need a couple of things uh, to prove uh, to to define beta invariance. So uh, first is a pseudo effective threshold. So um, this is basically the threshold until which this volume is positive. So um, as, he, as he stated yesterday, this is going to be uh, zero if it, is, if it is not pseudo effective anymore. So you want to just understand until what point is this always positive, right? Um, so that's going to give you the pseudo effective threshold. And um, the next is something that's called log discrepancy, which is, um, one plus the order of the canonical along, uh, along E. Um, just to give you uh, an idea of how this uh, works, if your E was not um, an F exceptional divisor, then your order will just be zero. So your A will just be one. 
Um, so that just gives you an idea of how you would go about calculating A. Um, and once you have these things, you can then define what beta is. Um, so if you remember yesterday, he defined it as AX of E minus SX of E. So this is exactly what uh, SX of E is. And uh, it's generally from zero to infinity. But the thing is, if, you're, if your uh, lambda is beyond um, your pseudo effective, your volume is always going to be zero. So this is, it, it, there's no point um, integrating beyond that. So it's just gonna be a finite integral until you're pseudo effective. Um, but uh, I can also give you a rough idea of how you do this. So if you're within your pseudo effective, um, as I said, if you're, above, if you're above it, your volume is zero. If you're within it, uh, you go about finding the NEF threshold of this. So you, you compute the Seychadri constant of this. Um, if the divisor itself is NEF, then your volume is just the square of um, your divisor. So it's just the square of this. But if it's, uh, so, which means until your NEF threshold, your volume of D is just D square. Uh, but if you're beyond your NEF threshold, then you find something called the Zariski decomposition. Uh, where what you do is you you take your divisor, find there'll be a nef component to it, so you you have to now separate it into a nef component and a sum of uh, a bunch of curves, which basically will have negative um, intersection form by itself. So it'll have it'll be negative definite, and uh, the intersection of that with your nef part will be zero, um, and then your volume is just the square of your nef part. Uh, we will do this. We will do an example where we'll compute the volume explicitly. So you'll know, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But this tells you how you would go about uh, calculating this integral. And then, uh, of course, it's just A minus the integral. So this is how you compute your beta. But how, uh, how is this related to um, our um, case stability conditions? So we have few criteria for that. So we have few assertions. The first one is Fujita and Lee criterion, which was uh, the evaluative criterion, basically. Uh, which states that X is k stable um, if and only if your beta of E is greater than zero for every uh, prime divisor E. Um, and it's k semi-stable if and only if it's greater than or equal to zero for every prime divisor. But note that you need to do this for every prime divisor. And there are gonna be infinite number of them. So this is a lot of work. It's not that easy to show that beta of E is greater than zero um, for all of them, because you need to show it for all of them to prove k stability. So um, something that simplifies this a little bit is this um, criterion, which was given by Zhuang, which states that if you take G to be um, an, a reductive group in your automorphism, uh, reductive subgroup of your automorphism group, then you just have to take the G invariant prime divisors and you calculate your beta of those prime divisors. Um, and then it will, uh, that's enough to show that X is K polystable. Uh, you'll notice I've written dreamy. I'm not going to define it because it's a little too technical, but all that basically says is if you take um, the graded uh, uh, sections, the sections, so the algebra of the graded sections, then it's going to be finitely generated. Um, but yeah, so we can ignore that for now, but all that it says is if your group is something that's really big, that the number of devices for which you need to compute your beta, which are because they're, they only need to be G invariant, are going to be very minimal. So it's much easier to do it using this. We will be using this to compute uh, beta. So you will understand how we, we one can use this criterion. Um, can I ask a question about the criteria? Yeah, sure. So what it says there, where G is any reductive group, is enough to test it for one? No, you need to test it for all of them. I am assuming it's enough if you test it for one. For one, okay. Yeah. One good. Yeah. Um, one group, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's good enough to. The bigger group, the better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. So we also have um, these, which in a way act as um, act as restrictions, uh, obstructions to k poly stability or k stability. So this one states uh, by by Alper, Bloom, uh, Halpern, Leister, and Zhu that if X is k poly stable, then the automorphism group has to be reductive. Uh, I give you an example of why this is very useful. Um, if you take weighted projective space, your automorphism group is never reductive. So this immediately tells you that none of them are k-poly stable. So it's already uh, a very good obstruction to uh, k-poly stability. You can already exclude so many that cannot be k-stable anymore, right? Um, 
And similarly, you have something else. You have, if X is K stable, then automorphism group is finite. This was given by Bloom and Zhu in 2019. And this is also a, a very good abstraction. You will see, we'll be using this um, in, a, in our example as well. So you will see how, when you just look, when you, when you can find the automorphism group of something that you're working with, and if you know it's not finite, then you immediately know it's not K, K stable anymore. So it's a good obstruction uh, as well. So we have these. And this is just for, because I was um, using K poly stability and K stability here and there, I just wanted to recall what the implications are. So K stability is the stronger one. If you know that, then you know everything else. You know it's K poly stable. You also know it's K semi stable. Um, uh, and if it is not K semi stable, then we, we say X is unstable basically. Okay. So we have all of this um, now. So let's now look at just explicit calculation. So you see how this goes, how do you go about computing this? So let's look at an explicit example. Um, now for the next 20 minutes, I'm just gonna work with this uh, surface. So you have um, a surface in P11, N plus one, N plus one, um, and it's of degree uh, N plus N plus two. Okay, so it's a hypersurface here. And um, you have to first write the equation of S using, so it'll be the list of all monomials which have uh, weighted degree added up to n plus n plus two. So it's quasi homogeneous, but you can always uh, do a coordinate change to bring it down to the form I've written here. But the one thing that you should be careful with is the fact that my F uh, is going to split as n plus n plus two linear terms, because if it is not, then that means my F is going to have some multiple root um, then it will no longer be quasi smooth. So because you want it to be quasi smooth, it will split. You can actually check this. If, you, if it has a multiple root, it will end up that you have a singularity there. So um, for it to be quasi smooth, it has to split as n plus n plus two um, linear ones, which is how I'm now, um, I'm now representing it, okay? And um, if you figure out what the singular points of S are, then um, you will notice that because I said S was well-formed, one of the conditions of it was that the co-dimension two strata of uh, singular points of P should not be in S. And um, you'll see that, you, you know that the way, for a weighted projective space, it's going to have uh, singularities um, of index AI in every, um, in every weighted variable. So it's going to have a one over N plus one, one, one in, in PZ, which is exactly what the singular point of S is. One over N plus one, 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 uh, exactly at P. So it's, it's at PP. And these are your singular points of S. One way to look at it is you work with different patches, work with a patch uh, where one of the variables is non-zero. And then you look at how uh, your cyclic group can act there. And then uh, look for your local coordinates in that patch. So if, uh, for example, in PP, your local coordinates will be um, will be x, y. So um, once you know that, you, you will know exactly what the weights of the singular, uh, how the singular point looks like, etc. So once you do those things, you know, okay, S is going to be singular in these two points. And the next step um, is going to be to blow up one of these points. So first, I'm going to take a hyperplane uh, and it's going to cut my, uh, it's going to be z is equal to zero, cutting my surface S. So it's gonna be a bunch of curves. It's gonna be a bunch of N plus N plus two curves. Um, and I'm gonna do a weighted blow up of PT. PT was the point where T was one, everything else was zero. So zero, 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 one. And as I said, the local coordinates there will be X and Y. So you're gonna do a weighted blow up of this point. Um, and I'm going to take E to be the exceptional there. And then LI bar and HZ bar could be the proper transforms uh, after the blow up. Um, so first, what do we have? You can write what F star of Li is in terms of um, Li bar and E. Once you do that, because you know HZ is just a bunch of Li, you can just write um, what F star of HZ is. Why do we need this? Because in order to calculate our beta of E, which is what we're gonna do, you need this divisor. Uh, this is exactly, if you remember, this is exactly the divisor for which you're finding, um, you need the volume to be positive so that you find your um, pseudo effective, you're finding the volume for this uh, in your integral, et cetera. So you need this divisor. And uh, with a junction, you can show that this is nothing but two over one plus n head set. So all that you're ending up with is this. And then I'll, I'll be using this in order to show that this divisor is nothing but um, uh, the one that's given here. 
So um, once you know this, you can already see that your pseudo effective uh, threshold is at least this number. So it's gonna be at least this. Um, but then if you, if you have your lambda to be bigger than this value, then because my Li bar square is negative, it will intersect this negatively, which I don't want anymore because I want it to be a pseudo effective threshold. So it's going to be, which immediately implies that my pseudo effective will only be equal to this value. Um, and I mean, this is true because, I mean, these are a bunch of curves which, which are passing through ET. So the minute you blow it up, it's going to get, it's going to uh, separate. So it's going to be this joint. Um, so your Li bar square is going to be minus one, your Li bar dot Li, Lj bar is going to be zero and so on. So once you know these intersection values, this is very easy. Um, so now I know what the pseudo effective threshold is, but that's not enough. All that this is telling me is okay, beyond this, my volume is zero, but is it also my NEF threshold? So you need to find your NEF threshold. Um, and the way you do about doing it is you intersect these with the curves, you intersect it with Li bar and all that. Um, with Li bar, you'll notice that it is positive only until your two over M plus one. When you go beyond that, it becomes negative. So within zero to two over M plus one, this is already a NEF divisor. And hence your volume of the divisor is just the square of that divisor. So it's just the square of this. Um, and because we know all the we know all the intersections. Um, we know what Li bar dot Lj bar is, etc. It's it's just a matter of just normal computation. It's just a square of this. Okay. So once we know that uh, beyond that uh, NEF threshold until my pseudo effective, it's no longer NEF. So you need to find uh, the Zariski decomposition of this. And this is what I was uh, talking about earlier. So when you want to find the Zariski decomposition of this, this is going to split as something that's NEF plus a bunch of curves. Um, these bunch of curves will should have um, the intersection form to be negative definite, ideally, so that you can contract them. And the intersection of that along with this should be zero. So then what, what it ends up being is that volume of this divisor will just be the nef part square. So it's just the square of this, which is what we have here. So, um, the way you go about computing this is okay, you want to understand the Zariski decomposition of this because you have this condition, you want to subtract those curves which intersect this negatively. So those curves which makes this divisor not NIF. So you kind of remove that uh, so that the rest that, that is left behind is your NIF part and then you have the rest. So, and then the volume is just a square of this. So this is what your Zariski decomposition tells you. Um, okay, so now we we have everything, almost everything we need for beta. We just need to compute what our AX of E is, our log discrepancy, and then we are done. Okay, so which is what I'm gonna do next. So my AS of E is one plus the order. If you are to write what this is, so remember this was a weighted blow up. So that immediately tells you what uh, your order of uh, KS is along E because uh, it's just M minus one over M plus one. And so it's just one plus that. So uh, that gives you your ASOP, and then um, you compute uh, your K squared times SXOV. So this is just the integral uh, from zero to your threshold of the volume. And so if you remember, this is exactly what we did in our previous slide. So from zero to a NEF threshold, this was the volume, and then from NEF to a pseudo effective. So um, now we know this, and uh, beta value is just um, AX of E uh, minus one over K squared times my SX of E, which is what I have now. And uh, let's just look at this now. So to analyze what values we have depending on N and M. So if N is less than M, which means if this value is, if this value is gonna be bigger, then my beta is negative. So I have just found uh, a prime divisor E uh, for which my beta value is negative. So automatically it's K unstable because it has to be greater than zero for every prime divisor for it to be uh, greater than or equal to zero for every prime divisor to be semi, uh, for every prime divisor so that my S is uh, K semi-stable. And now that I have found something for which is less than zero, it's not gonna be K semi-stable anymore. And that's exactly what I call K unstable. Um, and if N is equal to M, uh, these two values are just equal. So it's just beta V being zero. Um, 
And uh, again, with the same criteria, you, your beta of E should be greater than zero for every uh, prime divisor E for it to be, for X to be case stable. So we already have a prime divisor E for which beta is zero. So we immediately know that this cannot be case stable. But there is one more way, even if you, if you, find, if you find the automorphism group of this, then uh, you'll notice that it is not finite. So that is also going to give you, using that obstruction uh, by uh, Bloom, that it is not case stable anymore, which is what we're gonna do now. So let's consider just the case when N is equal to M, okay? So now we're just looking at this surface where uh, my N and M are equal. So I have the surface S uh, in P11 uh, and N, and it's of degree two N. I have this uh, equation, which is exactly the same as before, uh, just that, of course, it was N plus M plus two. So N and M being equal, uh, it's just two N. And I'm looking at just N greater than one because when N is one, it's just a quadric for which we already know the answer. We already know it's two polystable. So I'm not gonna look at that. I'm just gonna exclude that case. So it's just N greater than one. And besides my method actually won't work for a quadric. So um, it's, we're just gonna work with n greater than one. Um, okay, so uh, we have uh, this uh, projection onto the coordinates, onto the first coordinates, x and y. Uh, and uh, if you notice, it's gonna be undefined when x and y are zero. So you're just left with these two points over which it's undefined. And these are exactly the singular points of my surface. Because again, if you remember from our previous case, we had two singular points we and they were of type one over n plus one, 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 and one over m plus one, one, one. Here n and m are equal. So both of them are basically just one over n, one, one type uh, singularities. And uh, we're gonna try um, understanding uh, beta value of g invariant curve. So I'm gonna take my automorphism group here, uh, which is just C star um, cross Z2 and the action of C star and Z2 are very explicit. So Z2 is my, so my involution just swaps my Z and T, it's just gonna swap these two, and my C star is gonna act this way. So already you can notice that any curve that's given by X and Y is going to be invariant with respect to G. Okay, it's something to just keep in mind, we'll come, come to that later. Um, but we have this to be a automorphism group. Now, what am I gonna do? Um, I'm gonna first, um, yeah, so again, so just to uh, um, re-emphasize what I had said earlier, because my automorphism group here is not finite, I immediately know my surface cannot be k-stable. Okay, so I, I already know that. So it's either a k-polystable or k-semi-stable at the most. Okay. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm first going to uh, understand the geometry of the surface because that really helps. So uh, let's just blow up the points PT and PZ. Uh, and this is the composition of those two blow-ups. So um, E1, E2 being the exceptional divisors of the blow-ups. Um, and then we have uh, the following commutative diagram. So it, it, so H is basically just resolving the indeterminacy of this projection. Um, and then you have this to be commutative. So P is just a composition of these two. Um, let's just look at this uh, to understand how the fibers of this uh, looks like. Okay, so if you're, if you're going to take any point here in P1, which means you're fixing your X and Y, and you want to look at the fibers above it. So if you remember the equation of this, of S was basically just ZT is equal to F of XY, where F was just two N linear factors. Um, so if I'm going to fix X and Y, my right side is going to be just a constant because my F will just be a constant. You've already fixed X and Y. So your F is going to be just some constant. So my, it's, it's, so this equation is just going to have ZT is equal to a constant. So the constant could either be a zero because if I choose my X and Y to be roots of F, then my ZT is just zero. Uh, maybe if I go back to the equation, you'll understand better. So if I, if I fix my X and Y, this is fixed. So my ZT is just a constant. If I take the X and Y such that it's the root of this polynomial, I just have ZT equals zero. So I have reducible fibers. Um, and if it is any other constant, they're just conics. Right? So it's a conic bundle that we have. Um, but again, one more thing to notice is that this is something that has degree 2n. So at the most, you can have only 2n roots. So it's going to have um, only 2n uh, degenerate fibers. It's going to have only 2n reducible fibers, basically. Um, so if I was to represent that in terms of a picture, this is how it looks like. So you'll have 2n of them, which are reducible. 
and um, the rest are just irreducible conics. So this is otherwise even called, uh, I believe, exceptional conic bundle. This is the way they define it. So um, I'm I'm just going to take a, take some time to understand how G acts on this, uh, and then we can we can very clearly see what the G invariant prime devices are for which we need to compute beta. So we have G to be C star cross Z2. So let's first understand what involution is doing to it. What is Z2 doing to this? Uh, Z2 was swapping my Z and T. So basically it's going to swap these two points, right? So it's going to swap, when I blow up, it's going to swap E1 and E2. Um, yeah, so it's going to swap all of these. So these points are going to be fixed by uh, Z2, by my involution. And then when I, when I am looking at C star, um, so each one of these fibers, it's just P1 without these two points. So that's just multiplication of, so C star will just be normal multiplication. And that will be the same in each one of these fibers as well. So it's, it's only going to fix these two points. It's going to fix these two points. It's going to fix all the red points in, in my diagram. It's going to um, fix all of them, but then involution is swapping it. So um, that's something you need to remember. So it's going to fix these as well, okay? So from what we have now said, it looks like only these points and these uh, irreducible fibers are the ones that are fixed by both C star um, and my Z2. So that those are the only ones which are G invariant because these ones are anyway swapped by involution and so on. So now it's very clear. Um, we have only, um, so if I'm gonna look at uh, the pencil that's generated by the curves X and Y, um, because of the way my, my group was acting on it, if you remember, it wasn't doing anything to X and Y. So anything that's in this pencil is going to be invariant to it. So any, all these irreducible curves in this pencil are going to be G invariant. And um, the reducible curves in these, which were uh, exactly, oh, um, which were exactly from this picture, these, which are two N in number, you're gonna have these points. And if the exceptional devices above these points are going to be G invariant. Okay, and you can also, there's another way of looking at it. The, the, from the diagram that I have drawn, you can look at it as fibers of this conic bundle. So it's either the irreducible fibers or the exceptional device and the exceptional devices uh, above these points of intersections of each of these components. Um, so we have these, but why are we done if we find a beta of F and beta of E? Because one thing you need to check is when you're looking at this blow up, um, so you have E now, you should check if your G is fixing any point on E as well. Because if it is, then you need to work with that component next because you're not done then. But in this case, when you work with the patches um, in, in the exceptional with very explicit like equations uh, of the exceptional, you will notice that your G um, doesn't fix anything on E. So it's, it's enough if you just find beta of F and beta of E. Okay, so we, we, that's exactly what we're gonna do. So beta of F, um, so F is a curve in that pencil. So again, with a junction, this is, this is what you'll get. And then you find the pseudo effective, exactly the same way as I said before. Uh, in this case, you'll notice that the NEF threshold is actually equal uh, to the pseudo effective. So the whole, whole time in the interval zero to this divisor is already NEF. So the volume is just the square of it. And again, it's just A minus this. And again, as I said, because my F here is not an exceptional one, um, your A is just one. Uh, and then you have SX. So again, so it's just positive now. So beta of F is done. We need to do the same for beta of E. So I'm taking the two components um, of the reducible fibers to be C1 and C2. And then I'm blowing up the intersection point between the two. Uh, I'm taking E to be the exceptional there and then C1 tilde and C2 tilde to be the proper transforms. So now I want to find out what beta of E is. Again, this is just the normal uh, usual junction that we did there because C1 plus C2 is the same as just F. Um, and um, again, so you have you need this divisor. Once you have this divisor, you figure out what your uh, pseudo effective is. Um, and uh, you also need the NEF threshold again. So you find what the NEF threshold is. You will see that until it is two over N, this intersects it positively. Uh, after that, this is the intersection of this divisor with C1 tilde plus C2 tilde is going to be negative. So when you are beyond two over N, that's exactly what you subtract. You subtract the part of the divisor, the curves, which make the divisor not NEF. You subtract that. 
So the rest of it that remains is going to be NIF. But you do it in such a way that this intersects this divisor by zero and the rest of it is just negative definite. So once you do that, you just have this to be the NIF part. And so the volume will just be the square of that NIF part. Um, so now we're done. We're done computing all of this. And then beta is, as I said before, is just A minus one over K square SX. And then once you do that, you get, once you do the integrals, uh, you get this to be the beta value, which is always positive because we took N to be uh, greater than one. So uh, it implies that my X is K polystable. Okay, so very explicit computations um, that now show how, so it probably gives you a flavor of how you would compute beta. Okay, so now that we are done with this, uh, finally, to just conclude, what can we do next? What is it that's left open for us to do? Um, okay, there are still a lot of cases beyond um, I greater than two that are still open. Um, whatever we have done till now may work, we, we are hoping it will, but it, uh, it's still a lot, a lot of the cases are still open. But there are some obstructions that you can still use uh, to, to do it. But so basically the problem now is to classify all K polystable nice hypersurfaces, so hypersurfaces which have the properties that I am stating uh, with index greater than two. But we have few obstructions um, that will help us. So we have this one that's given by Gauntlet, Martelly, Sparks, and Yao, which states that if your I is greater than three A naught, then my SD is automatically K unstable. This is actually pretty easy. It, it, uh, it follows from um, your evaluative criterion in a way, because if your A naught, um, so in, in, you can actually see that. So if your A naught is equal to one and uh, you take any degree one uh, hypersurface, okay, so now you look at the index. Your index is going to be three plus A1 plus A2 plus A3 minus one. So you have basically two plus A1 plus A2 plus A3 as the index. So if your A1, A2, A3 were anything bigger than one, then you already have your index to be greater than three. So any such surface is going to be K unstable. So this is already giving you a lot of examples of hypersurfaces which are going to be K unstable. Um, so that's already a good obstruction. You also have another one by Sporty, which states that if you're taking any of these uh, del pesos with quotient singularities, um, and you have this G to be a finite group here in GL2, and SD has a quotient singularity with respect to this group, then it's going to be key unstable if this holds. Again, a good obstruction for you to check. Um, there are a lot of examples where this holds and immediately you know that's not. So for example, it might not hold here, but it might hold here. So it, this at least tells you that it's key unstable and so on. So using these uh, and using the new techniques we have now, which is computing beta and delta invariance and so on, it should be, uh, it should be doable to, do, to, do, uh, to answer this question of classifying all of them, which is what I think I'm very optimistic about. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say for today. So. Thank you. I don't know fast that clicking the mute button. Uh, okay, I'm gonna pause the recording so that people feel more freely about asking questions. Um, could, could I ask about this uh, Cristiano's Aussie result you mentioned? <clears throat> is, this, yeah. is this an ultra pro 